The Turing test has been considered the ultimate test to determine if an AI has human level intelligence. And Alan Turing came up with this test back in the 1950s. The students like it. And originally it was called the imitation game, which I think is the truer purpose of the actual test. The problem with this though is that Alan Turing, brilliant as he may have been, was actually limited by his sort of unique inability to predict the future. Because he was born back in 1954, which is actually 24 years before the first personal like home computer, the Altair, came on the market. And the computer that handled the trip to the moon was not really much more powerful than your average calculator is today. So just imagine that for a second. Unless he was the only person in history to actually be able to tell the future, he probably wouldn't have imagined that one day there would be a computer that a regular person could have in their home. And even if he could have imagined that, he would have never imagined that nearly every single human on Earth would at some point have a smartphone in their pocket that was vastly more capable than even the fastest computer that he could dream about. And all of these people would be able to write and be having conversations over the internet that would be available for something like Google to see. And so what I'm actually getting at here is that when Alan Turing, or Al as I like to call him, came up with the Turing test, he wouldn't have been able to predict that one day we would actually have access or we would have something like Google that would have access to billions of conversations, text messages, emails, blog posts, and all that sort of stuff that could be used as training data to learn from. And that's actually what Google's AI currently has available to train on. Their AI can use blog posts on the internet, every conversation on an Android device, every email you send, and from that it can actually see what people tend to say and what people tend to respond to those things. And so much more. And it can do this for billions of conversations. And so I thought I'd show you just how like stupidly brilliant Google's AI actually is by just presenting a sequence of numbers to you. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And I ask you to guess what the 10th number will be. What would you guess? I'm guessing you're gonna guess that the 10th number will be 10. And uh, that's correct. But the reason that you're actually guessing that is because you've seen that sequence of numbers before. You know that after nine comes 10. And since the sequence is in order from one to nine, you're gonna guess that it's probably gonna be 10 because that's the most likely thing. Or it could be like one or something like that. That might be the other guess that you would have. But the reason that I'm getting at here is that you've seen it before. So you have that data in your head as like training data. And that's what you're using to make a prediction now for the 10th number. And the way their computer would guess correctly here is only if they've actually seen the sequence of numbers many times before, or at least once. If the computer has only seen the sequence when you present it to it the first time, then it wouldn't even be aware of the number 10. If you weren't aware of the number 10, which number would you guess to be next? The reality is that this sequence of numbers could potentially be completely random, but it just ended up being in the order up until nine. So it looks like it is in order and you feel like it's a sequence of uh, numbers that has some sort of meaning to it that is not random, but it is possible for a completely random sequence of numbers to end up being one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 22. And this is actually really cool, I think, because if I change the numbers to something else, then you will actually be able to see what the computer sees. So let's just take a random string of letters, S, F, G, R, W, E, U, I. Now, what's the next letter? It's probably not that easy to guess, is it? Because to you, it seems like this string of letters is completely random and there's no pattern to it that you can recognize, I hope at least. I've tried to put together just a random sequence of letters. And so to you, it could be pretty much any letter that could come next. You might guess something that isn't in these letters because you know that there are other letters than the ones in this sequence. But other than that, you're pretty much lost and you don't know what to guess. And this is exactly what the computer would be seeing. Now, if that sequence of letter was in the order of the alphabet, let's say, then you would have actually been able to guess. So if the letter sequence looked like this, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, you would probably be able to guess that I is the next letter, or you would probably be pretty confident in guessing that I would be the next letter. And I know this might sound like stupidly simple, but this is actually what our current AI is able to do. 
it's only able to do like large scale predictions. And I'm not really sure if Alan Turing knew about this, but there are predictive models within mathematics that can essentially be used to just predict a certain outcome based on some input variables that you put into the algorithm. And our brains actually do this all the time. Like we predict certain things, we try to find patterns in the world. That's one of the things that our, us humans or our human brains are really good at. And that's why you also can look at like a random cloud and you can see a certain shape in it because your, your brain is essentially hardwired to look for patterns in everything that you see. And so that's what we're trying to do with our computers as well. And so that's what AI actually currently is. AI is currently just a predictive mathematical model that we've also included a feedback loop into. So it essentially means that this program can run on its own and it can learn and it can get better, but it only gets better in a very specific predictive or de deterministic way. So what happens is it will get a certain problem and then it will try to calculate what the next uh, outcome might be. So if it gets a sequence of numbers, it will try to calculate what the 10th number will be in that nine number sequence. And then the correct answer is given. And depending on how wrong the system actually was, it will adjust some values and variables in certain ways and attempt a new guess. So this is then what Google does with our texts and blog posts and YouTube transcripts, etc. All of the speaking, texting and writing can be used as the previous data. So if we perform the Turing test with the Google AI, then for each question that we ask, it will literally look at billions of conversations that it has ranked and created probabilities for. And it can use that in the algorithm to predict what someone would answer to a certain question. So if we were to perform the Turing test with the Google Lambda AI, then the first question that we would ask, it will literally look at billions of conversations, billions of text messages, emails, all that sort of stuff, and try to find a question that is similar to the one that we asked. And then we'll, it will find a response that it deems to be the most correct answer to that question. And then it will give us that answer. So if you ask a question, it's actually quite likely that it has seen the exact same question before and can just copy paste an answer that it has seen to that question. Or it will find a hundred similar questions and calculate based on probability what the most important parts of the question are and then what the most relevant answer would most likely be. So in essence, it is actually human. The response is actually human because it's based on our human conversations. It's not something that the computer itself just makes up. It's something that it predicts based on conversations that we have had with each other. And this is exactly what Alan Turing wouldn't have known and wouldn't have been able to predict or guess which is that we would first of all even have a system that would be powerful enough to do these sort of calculations as fast as it can do it. And then second of all, and most importantly, that we would even have access to that amount of data. And so that's why the Turing test today doesn't really work. And here's why, because if I give a toddler who can read a list of answers to string theory questions, and I ask them to read it when I ask a question, does that mean that the toddler understands string theory? Yes. Yes, it does. And that is basically what the Turing test unintentionally proves today. It proves only that the computer can calculate a sequence of letters into words and sentences that imitate what a human could potentially answer. And that's why the name The Imitation Game would have provided less confusion about what the test actually does. And so it's essentially just pattern recognition, which is just mathematics. And there seems to be thinking behind it when you have a conversation with an AI like that, or when you ask Google to do something for you. But the reality of it is that it's just mathematical equations that turn out a certain answer that is the most likely to be the answer to the question that you're asking. And not to jab at Elon Musk here, but he has been predicting autonomous cars since back in 2018. Six months and then you won't have to drive anymore. And he's been doing that for over five years, which I think really speaks volumes to how difficult of a problem it actually is to create First of all, like self-driving cars, but also an AI, a general AI or sentient AI of some kind. And he actually did an interview with uh, Lex Friedman very recently where he said that he had underestimated how difficult it would be to actually create these autonomous cars and self-driving. So I thought the self-driving problem would be hard, but it's, it was harder than I thought. It's not like I thought it would be easy. I thought it would be very hard, but it was actually way harder than 
than even that. And he thought that the problem was a lot easier back in a couple of years ago, but now he's realized that it is actually very difficult and there's a lot of stuff that we do in the human brain that is very difficult to translate into a computer in that sort of way. If you want to learn more about how AI actually works, then I highly recommend that you check out the course on neural networks over on brilliant.org. It's a really great course that will give you a great understanding of the AI that we currently have. You'll learn how to work with it and how it works, which means that you'll be able to understand what some of the limitations of this technology currently is. Brilliant is also really good at creating interactive and hands-on courses where you get to try things out as you go. And since they are a long-term partner of me and this channel, you also get a seven-day free trial of Brilliant Premium using the link in my description. So you can test this course out completely free and see what you think, which I highly recommend that you do. Brilliant also has other courses as well, courses that will teach you everything from how to code with Python to algorithm fundamentals to scientific thinking. I really can't recommend Brilliant enough and I'm proud to have them as a sponsor for this channel. And again, you get a seven day free trial of Brilliant Premium using the link in my description. And right now you also get a 20% discount on an entire year of Brilliant Premium. So go check it out at the link in the video description. At the end of this video, I would just like to say that I really dislike when people take someone that let's face or someone that's done something really positive and then try to find a flaw or fault within what they've done to try to make themselves look better. Essentially trying to push them down to make themselves look and feel better. And I hope this video didn't come across that way. I really love Alan Turing and Elon Musk as well. And I don't really think that uh, what they've done is like bad or anything like that. It was just, I feel like the Turing test is not necessarily it doesn't really hold up today is my theory, but I could also be wrong. So let me know in the comments if you have any like arguments against what I'm saying uh, and why you think the opposite or something like that, because I could miss certain things. And uh, I also highly recommend actually checking out the computer file video where Dr. Mike Pound, who actually is an expert, goes through and explains why the Google Lambda is not sentient. So go check that out. I'll leave a link to that in the description if I can remember it. And uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope I'll see you in the next one.